Hi, and welcome to another edition of The Seven Show. So I just released a video on how I readjusted my studio to fix some uh, acoustic problems I was having. I basically turned the whole studio 90 degrees. Um, it's the one before this one. If you want to watch it, go watch it. In that video, I talked, well, well, when I was filming the video, I talked about the treatments I put in. But some of that end, I ended up cutting out of the, the, the final video because I thought, you know what, maybe I'll just make another video. We'll talk about the treatments uh, a little bit more in depth. Not too in depth, but a little more, a little more in depth. And then I'll just give you kind of a rundown of how I've configured the studio, sort of my thought process. And then I have I built a couple of projects that um, are kind of cool. So I thought I'd share those. And then uh, maybe a couple little tips that you might be able to use in your own studio. Uh, one of them I've been doing for a while and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of handy and it's really simple. Like why don't more people do this? But we'll get to that. Let's talk about the treatments I put in. So I had originally built in my old configuration, I had built six fairly large deep treatments. I made them 16 inches deep and uh, some of them were like four feet tall and uh, I forget the actual dimensions, but here's a picture of them. And these are the dimensions of them. Those were basically designed to go in front of the console on that wall back there. Um, but then I turned everything around so I had to find another space for them. So the really big ones are nice, big, deep base traps. Um, so I ended up putting those behind me in the the back kind of uh, what do you call that when the ceiling meets the floor there uh in that that section <laughs> they fit really well back there um i'm not going to use that space for anything so uh they're ideal there then the the medium sized ones i ended up putting on, on either side of those so there's one back behind the drums and then there's one kind of underneath the modular and then i had built these these pillars that were basically a foot square and maybe three feet tall, those are sitting back behind the console. So all of those are kind of acting as sort of base traps. Um, the, the two on either side are maybe not in the most ideal location, but I think I'm gonna build some more slightly larger ones and kind of fill up that extra space back there. And th those seem to be working okay in that location. Then I built a bunch of panels. Now, the, the larger traps, I made those out of pink fluffy insulation, just Owens Corning, something or the other. Um, after you get past about six inches in depth, rock wool isn't as effective, and the pink fluffy stuff is more effective. So that's what I used in those, and I made them 16 inches deep because I bought 16 inch deep or 16 inch wide. Uh, uh, pink insulation. So I just figured, well, it saved me from cutting it up very much. There are some online calculators, and I'll leave a link in the description to one that I like a lot. And it gives you basically uh, calculations. If, if your frequency is this deep, these are the frequencies it can stop. If you, if you mount it away from the wall, a particular distance, this is how much more effective it is. I'm not going to get a whole uh, I'm not going to get very deep into that because there's a lot of other videos that um, uh, people discuss this. And I will actually leave um, a link to another set of videos. Uh, the, the fellow who is doing those videos has a really, it's a Acoustic Insiders. He has a really uh, good way of speaking about how acoustics work and how they uh, how they react to porous absorption and, and diffusers and things. If you're interest, interested in that kind of stuff, his videos, and you're just getting into the subject, his videos are really good at explaining it. And he does a lot of uh, graphs and, and testing and examples and various other things. So I'll leave a link to that. So I don't have to go into it. <laughs> um, yeah, so then I made a bunch of panels after I got those in, I made a bunch of panels and I knew that right over the console, 
I'm going to need a lot of treatment because of these extreme angles. And I was already seeing uh, comb filtering and cancellations and things. So in front of the console here, I built um, some six inch deep ones. These I used pink insulation, the pink fluffy insulation. For the ceiling cloud, the three panels in the ceiling, those are also six inches um, thick. Because I figured I had a little bit more room there. I wanted to bring them away from the wall a bit and away from the ceiling a bit and drop them down. Um, so the six inches and then, then the distance from the, the surface behind it, uh, a little bit more effective if I drop them down. On this side of the room, I was going to be probably moving around a bit more. I have, have some, some keyboard set up there. I'll have some drums and this will, you know, I'll be standing over there more. Here I sit, there I stand. So I made those panels uh, four inch thick. Those are using rock wool insulation. And there's three of those. And, and this configuration seems to be working really well for this kind of isolated space. It, it seems to be going okay. I might put in some more, as I mentioned in my previous video, I might put a few more in the back wall, but uh, I'm gonna work with this configuration for now and see how it is. Then on the side walls, uh, on that side, I have um, four inch thick panels and there's two of them up now. I'm gonna put a third one up, but that's where the stairs are. So it, it, I have to bring a ladder in and, and I'm also gonna finish that groovy Sputnik lamp that's uh, not, I haven't put the bulbs in it yet because it's, it's uh, only, I had the wrong screws to hold the, the mount in place. So I, it's just kind of dangling there, not even hooked up uh, soon, very soon. Um, and then on this side, I built uh, square panels to fit into that space. And um, those are also four inch thick. In the center, there's a, a kind of a weird looking thing. So that's actually the mount that I had my, my large, remember the big monitor that I had in here? That's what I mounted it on. And it's, it's a, a mount that's designed to go over fireplaces for your, for your big monitors. And then you can bring them and, and pull them down and they kind of hang in front of the fireplace. And then when you're not using it, you can lift it up. I didn't have a, that monitor ended up going into the house and uh, I didn't really have a use for that monitor mount. And I got a really, really good deal on it. So it's not worth me pulling it off the wall and getting rid of it. So I was trying to think of another use for it. And I thought, well, hey, I'll just make this, uh, this sort of movable mic stand thing. I built a panel. I took some, some Oralux foam that I had laying around and I covered the panel. So it's a, it's a four inch thick rock wool insulation with the, um, with the Oralux in front of it. I can mount a mic right in front. I can pull it down to the height that I need and then it, it'll stop reflection coming from behind the microphone. Not sure how super effective it is, but it's nice to have sort of a, when I do vocals and things, or if I'm doing like, uh, if I'm doing singing vocals or if I'm just doing speaking uh, type work, I can actually go there. Uh, I have a nice place that I can just sort of stand and it'll be kind of a common place to do that. Yeah, we'll see if it works. If not, I'll rip the thing out of the wall and uh, find some better place to do vocals. <laughs> All right, this side of the room is where I have my server rack that I've built. Uh, I was going to make a video on it, but I figured eh, it's easy enough to just sort of explain what I'm doing. You don't need to see me build a box, but that's basically it. I, I bought a, a metal uh, server frame and then uh, built a three quarter inch plywood box around it. There's a, a, a vented labyrinth underneath and on top of it. So what the what the vented labyrinth is is it's just sort of a maze that the air can go through and then there's insulation in that that pathway and that stops sound from esca escaping so when i get the when i get the front and the back on this basically the air for the computers these these are all in server cabinets and so server cabinets are designed designed to pull the cold air in the front of the cabinet and exhale the hot air out the back. And in data centers, you usually have a cold aisle and a warm aisle. 
in the cold aisle, uh, you have rows of server cabinets and, and it's the, the fronts of all of these servers in the cold aisle. And then the hot aisle, it's the backside of all the servers. You just have rows and rows of them. And then the, the AC unit pulls the air out of the hot aisles and spits the treated colder air into the cold aisles. That's the idea. So I just use that to my advantage on this. So air will be pulled in through the bottom of the cabinet, through this labyrinth, and it'll come out to the front of this rack. The computers will pull that air in. They'll uh, spit it out the back of the cabinet. At the top of the cabinet, there's a, a couple of big fans and I have a fan control, temperature control, fan control on it. And then that will push the air out a labyrinth, which then comes out the top in the back. So ideally with, with the, the front and the back on this cabinet, we shouldn't hear anything. And I tested it and it actually works fairly well. Um, and because I'm using server grade computers, there's a lot of fans that are a little bit noisier. So that should take care of that. Oh, you're probably wondering what those little Cylon things are that are blinking back and forth. Those are for like, I got them for like 20 bucks and they're basically power strips, but they accept a, an audio input. And I thought $20 for a rack mounted power strip. That's great. You know, I'll, I'll get those and, and I'll get a little light show with them. But, um, they, uh, they're a little annoying. Those blues are really bright, but I'm going to use them anyway, just cause they're fun. And I've got a headphone out. I have a headphone splitter that comes out of the console. And I basically, you can, these have ins and outs for the audio signal. So it basically goes out of a spare headphone output. And then I've got it chained to all of these. So when I'm running music through the console, these things hear it and, eh, it's just sort of a goofy thing. On consoles, there's this little scribble strip here and a lot of people will put tape down and then write in, you know, okay, this is a snare drum. This is a vocal. This is a bass, whatever. A while ago, I came up with this idea that this is always some sort of metal and uh, I could stick magnets to it. So I made all of these little, these little stickers. So piano, this is the piano track. I just stick it there. And uh, if I want to move it, I just slide the piano track to the new one. And then here's a, here's a microphone and here's a synth. And I could just label my, my channels on the console like that. It, it works really well because then I don't have this nasty scribble strip that gets all kind of gross with old tape and things. Um, and I just pick this up and move it wherever I need it. I've made ones for, um, uh, there's, there's guitar one, two, and three. I have, uh, various bass ones, different, uh, drum parts, kick drum, hi-hat, snare, crash, whatever, various orchestral sounds, horns, strings, winds. These are all synthesizers. So, uh, these are just generic synth sounds or here's for a D50 or the PC 88 or the JX three P or whatever. Uh, then I, then I can keep track of where they are in the console. It, it seems to work fairly well. And it, uh, it's, it's kind of a pain to sit and make a whole bunch of labels and stick them to magnets. But once you only got to do it once and once you're done, then you can use them. I've had these for, uh, 20 years, some of them <laughs> using the same stupid stickers for 20 years. So this, this part of the studio ended up being synthesizer corner. <laughs> it was synthesizer corner was originally spread out throughout the studio in my original configuration, but everything just kind of fit over here, uh, really nicely. So I've got my, my modular is now built up. I added this whole section and built a rack for it. Uh, I added LFO slew limiter, sample and hold, uh, VCA, this big fixed filter bank uh, and a filter bank aid. Um, I have, now I have some instrument interface. Um, and what else did I add? Yeah, a few other things. I think I added another couple more, more filters and whatever. I have all my little, uh, Behringer semi mods here. Uh, the pro pro one neutron and the model B 
This is a Roland uh, A49 uh, controller. Doesn't make any sound, it just controls MIDI stuff. Um, I got this, put it on a, bought this table, put a shelf in it so that I could mostly use it to control this. But the way I've got all the MIDI set up, I can actually control any synth from this point. And I think that if, if you have like four or five synthesizers, maintaining your MIDI is fairly simple, but I've got over 20 now. I've at my high point, I think I had 30 some odd synths and they were all wired in uh, and MIDI connected. So I could basically just turn them on and go whenever I wanted to. I think that that probably deserves its own video on how to, how to manage um, lots and lots of MIDI devices. I'm using these Motu, they're USB devices, and these actually plug into the DAW across the, across the room. I just have really long MIDI extenders. Um, so there's, there's a eight channel MIDI Motu here. There's a five channel up there. There's another five channel over there. And, uh, but I'll, I'll make a, a video on how this is all connected and how I maintain it all because it's, it makes things really easy. Um, how I've got it, get, got it connected. And as long as you, as long as you have a label maker, it's, it's easy to, to, to work with. Uh, this is my, my rack of, uh, rack mounted synths and things. There's a vocorder in there too. Um, and then my patch base. So all of these synths go to either this patch bay or this patch bay. This patch, patch bay, this is the trunk patch bay that goes over to the console. So here I've got, I have the deep mine plugged in. They're going to 15 and channel 15 and 16 in the console. I have the PC 88 uh, over there. They go to channels three and four on the console. Everything's labeled. So it's really easy to kind of figure out where things go. Um, I also, on this particular one, I have, I have these labeled blue, black, red, white, green, orange, et cetera, et cetera. I have eight channels that just terminate here so that I could plug them into the modular or I could plug them into any of these semi, semi mods, or if I have a desktop synth or something that I want to use, I could set it on this table and just plug it in. That goes right to that patch bay. I could run cables from here to that direct in patch bay. But I thought this would just uh, managing cables and sort of excess stuff hanging all over the place might help to manage that a little bit better. This is one of my favorite things that I've built in a while. And uh, it's something that I've been wanting to do for a long time, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Uh, I built a variation using Baker racks, but it, it wasn't as space conscious as this is. So in the old configuration, I had that big metal A-frame uh, that I had, I had actually extended it. I, I bought some extra metal tubes and made it taller than the original ult ultimate support stand because I think that was only about four feet tall. This one was about six feet tall. That allowed me to add uh, five shelves to it. But it just, it takes up a lot of room because it's an A-frame and so there's got to be a better way. So this is the better way. Basically what I did was I just built a bookshelf, <laughs> but instead of, uh, instead of shelves, they're, uh, they're slide out drawers. So any synth that I want to play, I just slide it out and, uh, do the little part on it, get that all, uh, midied in and recorded or whatever. And then I just push it out of the way and, um, everything is connected up to a power strip. So one switch turns everything on. They're all MIDI connected up into these or up to that Motu up there. It's, it's cool. I like it. I'm really happy with it. The only thing I need to do is anchor it to the wall. I haven't done that yet. I'm, I'm worried that if you were to open up like the top three drawers, the whole thing might get kind of tippy and uh, falling over on its face is, I, th I think in the mu music industry, that's called a bad thing. Um, but uh, yeah. I just, I basically measured my biggest synth to get the dimensions, which is the AX, I think the AX80 was the biggest one. It was the widest one and the deepest one that I wanted to put in here and the tallest. So I based my measurements on that. And then, uh, it's, it's four feet tall. I think it's, it's almost four feet wide. 
I want to say 37 inches, but that might not be right. Um, I can measure it, but I'm not gonna, but you know, everything fits in it. Um, it's open backed because my original plan was to put this over where I had the A-frame uh, rack. So I wanted to be able to get into the back to plug things in and out if I wanted to. This structure open back, you end up getting some kind of tweaking side to side. So there's some uh, triangular pieces of, of wood there. This is all made out of three quarter inch plywood uh, with laminated fronts and then this funny little thing on the top. Uh, same with the shelves. I laminated the fronts of those of the of the plywood, but there's triangular plywood pieces in the corners that gave it some rigidity and then there's actually a shelf here that doesn't slide out and that gave it some more rigidity and that seemed to work out fairly well. I'm really happy with this. It, it I've got seven synths in here now and um, it, uh, I could put another one on the top if I really wanted to, but that actually can hold some desktop synths and extra microphones and odds and ends and more, you know, more importantly, lava lamps. So, so this section over here is just sort of my general workstation area. Uh, this is where I can edit videos and do work and uh, die quickly playing Daisy. <laughs> Zombies. Uh, over here, with, this is the, the monitor for the DAW. Um, and I can switch this back and forth between the DAW or my workstation. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, main, D50 is my main synth controller that I use a lot just because I really like the action. So I've got that over here. One of the things I wanted that I talked about having different monitors around. So that's a sound bar up there that got some fairly good reviews. And I thought that would, and you can mount it on its, on the wall like that. So I got that. I can pipe out from the from the Behringer control to USB device. That pipes over to here so I can turn this on and have sound and see what it sounds like on the, uh, on the sound bar. It's kind of handy. Um, one thing I did notice about the sound bar, even though it's plugged in directly to, it's hardwired in, it's not using Bluetooth or anything, there's a very slight delay on this one. So that might end up going somewhere else. Um, I may end up just getting rid of it. Um, Maybe I'll put it in my living room or something. I don't know. It's, it's very, very slight, but I notice it when I've got sound coming out of those monitors over there, that that very, very tiny delay is very apparent when, when you're in a room like this. So that might end up going somewhere else. So then the backside behind the console, uh, PC 88, Juno six, um, various odds and ends. Those are the, the treat the big treatments I was talking about and on top of that is my cheap Amazon foam that I did the review on that is uh, totally useless but it looks okay up there I guess <laughs> it's a, sort of at the top of the of the it's better than throwing it away for now anyway uh, back behind me uh, the strike pro Elisa strike pro congos you know various other odds and ends and noise makers so that's sort of how I've got things configured. Um, and uh, I'm, I think I can say that right now my studio is done. So I've, I've started to, to work on some music in here and it, it, uh, I've, I've altered my flow a little bit and, and the more I work in here, I'll probably change a few things around a little bit, but pretty good configuration. I'm pretty happy so far. Um, I don't have anything else to say. So thanks for watching.